Mario C, as you've been witnessing, this is a, a very dense event. So, yes. the one okay. time I, I went over to Say's place, and I said, Say, let's do a podcast, it'll, it'll just take a half hour. And then an hour and a half later, it ended. So, just to stay true to time, I, I brought the clock from the Short Shot video. Remember this? This is, this is the actual Lux timer in the Short Shot video. I'm going to set it for, like, 20 minutes, okay? Yeah. I'll put it right on top of the drum kit there. 20-minute interview with Mario C. So my first question is, you're out in Los Angeles, I believe it's 1986. The Beastie Boys are on tour with Run DMC, and they, they planned this show, like a surprise show, at Power Tools in L.A. And I remember hearing a story where you said, the sound is shit. And wasn't the sound so bad that they had to stop the show? They never started the show. Oh, they never started the show. They got up on stage and checked the mic, one, two, one, two, and I believe Hurricane or the DJ had the record queued up and was like, shh, 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 shh. and then the first drum roll came, da -da -da -boom. the sound system shut off. But you remedied this, right? I was in the audience with my friend, uh, Mike Nishida, Money Mark's That's brother. Money Mike. And Not to be confused with Money Mark. Yeah, Mike's <laughs> brother, Mike, and yeah. We were just like amazed, They're like, uh oh, what's gonna happen now? You know, a thousand people in a room, no sound, and you know, I was, I was like frustrated. I was like, whoa, how could this happen? You know, like, we gotta, we gotta talk to somebody and see what's going on. You know, like I can see that there was chaos because they didn't know what to do. And then um, I said, well, I wonder who runs the place. And the guy goes, let's go ask the security guard. And I went and spoke to a guy, and he goes, that's the owner over there. So I went and said, hey. Um, is this your club? He's like, yeah. He goes, why? He goes, do you guys have a sound man? He goes, no, why? What do you know about sound? I go, I'm a sound man. So I said, okay, come take a look at the system. So that's that's when I um, I went to go have a look, and obviously I couldn't fix it at the moment. It, it was like a, a home system that got hot and turned off. But I got the gig at the club. The at Power week. Tools. Yes. And then at Power Tools, there was a guy named Matt Dyke who, who used to the spin there. Matt Dyke knew the Dust Brothers. That's the Beastie right. Boys wanted to work with the Dust Brothers on Paul's Boutique. That's it. And they wanted you to engineer the album. However, the record label didn't want Mario C. At first, well, no, they had they, a professional guy that they wanted to mix it. Of course. And they did, but then they went back and listened to the demos that, that we made. And the demos were much better and more raw. And that's, so they came, they came back to the demos. Now, there's a story that you actually had to fly the masters from California to New York and you handcuffed that to your wrist and to, your, to the other side of the handcuff was a briefcase. That's Is that, that true? Well, it was, wasn't officially handcuffed, but I was basically under 24-hour surveillance with the tapes, like constantly uh, having to take them home with me every night after the sessions. They were, you know, being summons and whatnot at the time. There was lawsuits. Because there was talk that Def Jam would steal the master recordings and claim them for their own. That's correct, because there was a lot of confusion. So to avoid it, they said, okay, Mario, take the tapes home with you every night. And then every night from all the sessions, I brought all these tapes, two-inch tapes back then, like several of them, uh, home. And then when it came time to master, I had to bring the, the reels with me, the, the final two-track masters, to New York and... Basically, you know, the bag never got more than six inches away from me. <laughs> wow. Um, so then, after Paul's Boutique, we've got Check Your Head, the first Beastie Boys album that you produced. You told me outside that this is your favorite Beastie Boys album. Why? Well, well, it's the favorite one that I happen to be working on. Um, okay. I, uh, whoa. That was a which, trick what's, your, what's your favorite that you haven't worked on? The first one. There's no question. License to Ill. License to Ill is a okay. that's If it wasn't for that, we wouldn't all be here. That that really like busted open all the possibilities, I think. And I think that they were at their rawest, you know, uh, as far as, you know, uh, free to say what they wanted and, and, and let it all out, you know. Well, the Beastie Boys start with License to Ill, and then they do Paul's Boutique, which is... A 180 a whole nother, yeah, exactly. from License Hill, and then they decide to play their instruments again, which is a 180 from Paul's Boutique. What That's did you right. think during this period? Well, well, that was the pinnacle record that changed everything because they, they were really like finding all the, the different elements together on one record. Because I don't think they were just, you know, uh, Ill, you know I mean, um, License to Ill, and they weren't completely just Paul's Boutique. 
they were a combination of everything. Mm -hmm. So they were still finding it, and I think that was the record that we put in three years of uh, intense love to, to make it. Now there's a handful of tracks on Check Your Head where the vocals are distorted, and they were recorded distorted. Now I know you like to keep it clean, so did you ever have a problem with the bullshit mic? And you hear the bullshit mic on So What You Want. So what you want, so what you want. You can't clean that up because they recorded it dirty. That's correct. That was because uh, with, we had the, uh, uh, like a demo rig, a, a B room where we would demo stuff. And in the, and in the room we used a, a, a Sony karaoke mic that was like a $29 bullshit mic. <laughs> and we, we did all the demos like, okay, let's just test it out real quick, like nothing fancy. So we got used to hearing that sound and then it was like, you know, let's try with, you know, let's go and try with the good mic. And then, whenever we did it, goes, no, the demo sounds much better. They, they, everyone was like, no, the demo's better. I'm like, all right. You know, like, eventually they convinced me, and after listening to it, like, oh, let's just go with it. And basically kept it, you know, kept the demo sound. So from then we used only those, you know, mainly that mic. But we changed it up a bit. There is, there is some different mics. Right. Now I wanted to ask you about So What You Want, because according to legend, the Beastie Boys are just about done with Check Your Head, and they need one more song to make it quick. And I guess they went up to the woods, they maybe went up to Adam's cabin, and they came back with So What You Want. So when you heard that song for the first time, what did you think? I was a slammer, there's no question. Right? Yeah. There's, there's just, you know, no question that the song and uh, the vibe of it was just unique at the, at the moment, too, when we were doing it, you know. You had Cypress Hill, you had NWA, and all these, you know, East, uh, I mean, West Coast guys coming up with some ill gangster stuff, and, and it just had that punch that was different than all of that, you know. And it was raw, and dirty, and punky, and you know, uh, nothing sounded like it. You know? I know. And the drum sound really made it. That was like in our studio. We had a, a special studio. So the bass and so what you want is that Adam playing bass? Because it sounds so much thicker than an actual bass. So well, so what boom. you want? I, you know, this boom, boom, <laughs> boom. boom. That's a tricky one, you know, because we use, we use a lot of different elements, you know. We, we sample stuff, and then there was stuff played on top of it. Uh, we added, like, the beat. Um, there's a big beat on it, and then there's the, the groove, and then we added some extra bass, and we added keyboards. But there is some, there's some elements. Speaking, speaking of keyboards, yeah. your buddy, Money Mark, was brought into the mix That's on right. Check Your Head. Now, is the story true that at the G-Spot, where the Beastie Boys were living, where, where they recorded Paul's Boutique, a fence broke, and they called a carpenter, and Money Mark fixed the fence, and that's how he became part of the family. Yeah, basically one night uh, at the house they were renting, it was an amazing house, and some director uh, up, in the, up in the hills, and there's an electric gate, and, and the guy, I think his last name was Gilstein or something, where they had a big G on the gate. Uh huh. That's why it was called the G spot. The G spot, okay. obviously. And uh, the gate opened up slowly, automatically, and then I believe it was Mike coming in one day. Um, they, they rented cars, and they, you know, they, they were kind of new at driving and stuff. <laughs> I think he misjudged the gate a little bit and kind of went a little fast and smacked it and came flying down the driveway. And, he, and then he came in the house and was like, yo, Mike, you know, and he, oh, I think there's something wrong with the gate, you know, and it's, it's, it kind of got smashed a bit. And then I was like, oh, don't worry, I call my boy Mark. You know, he's a, he's a carpenter. He's working in Hollywood right down the hill. And uh, Mark come by with, you know, with your truck after work, whatever, and he has his tools, and, and he came by. And obviously he shows up with his keyboard, because he always has a keyboard. <laughs> and I go, that's my boy. You know, we were from high school, we had, you know, a band together, and he plays keyboards. Was it the Jungle Bugs? That was one of our bands. Okay. Yes, <laughs> phase, phase two. So that was the introduction right there. He showed up, come to fix the gate. Because for me, I don't think uh, Check Your Head is Check Your Head without Money Mark. Yeah, he plays a huge role in, uh, in the sound, creating the music and helping with the vibe, we kind of expanded. That's that's where it really expanded, and I think it makes it a unique and special record in that sense. So let's move on to Ill Communication. You actually appear on the back cover. There it is right over your head. There you are, Mario C. Oh, yeah. I believe you're wearing a hat with that, well, that bad word on it. Yeah. So right. how were the Beastie Boys out on tour? Because you were mixing live sound for them, right? Well, that was 
that was to me the most one of the most exciting part of the job is being in the years, uh, being with the guys in the studios for a couple years, three years to make Check Your Head, which is an awful long time. Nobody spends three years making a record unless nowadays everybody does because they work by themselves. But back then, when you had a group, we would actually go to the studio five days a week and you know work on stuff. It's a long time, and, and then they. They didn't tour off the Paul's Boutique, but on Check Your Head, we said we're for sure going to go on tour. So that opened up a uh, possibility to be going on tour and doing the sound live. So I was like, yeah, I'm, I'm in, because that's what I did, all the sound live. Do you have any good on the road Beastie Boys stories? Woo! Well, we have... Let's stick in the 92 95 era. Okay, 92, like Lollapalooza, Quadrophonic wow. Stereo wow. Tour. Well, yeah, Quadrophonic was after that. That was, yeah. That was 95, yeah. yeah. That was amazing. Um, there's so many incredible stories, you know, I can't pinpoint one. But we did have one exciting one that was in Poland. Okay, do tell. So this is a Mario C's adventure in Poland with the Beastie Boys. Quiet down a little bit. This is a very exciting story. Well, it was the uh, first, first time a rap band, especially of the magnitude of the Beastie Boys, to play in Poland, Warsaw, which is a very dark and dingy place. Uh -huh. We were, you know, breaking ground there, like, uh, it was kind of scary because they'd never had done a show there, they didn't know the promoter, they didn't know nothing, and we show up and, uh, at the hotel and, you know, the, and uh, checked in the night before, so we had to like, okay, we'll, we'll have dinner at the hotel, and they said, yeah, that's probably the best idea, and then we saw the, there was a band playing, and then the band was, oh, nice, the equipment, you know, and a little a trio, bass, drums, and guitar, and acoustic bass, Nice, you know, and then the next day we go to the gig <laughs> and we show up and they didn't bring in equipment, they rented equipment and it was the same equipment as the hotel band. <laughs> really? It was like, yeah, there's, there's not a lot of resources. And the, the concert was in a uh, tent, believe it or not, in uh, February, which is like winter. Sure. So like snowing outside and shit. <laughs> and this is like a huge outdoor circus tent, you know, like and there was kids from all over Poland that, that came out for the show and uh, they literally took 8 hour, 12 hour bus rides from everywhere in Poland to, to this gig and they were outside waiting to get in and just before they opened the door to get in we were there and uh, the, the promoter was like uh, just to let you guys know we got a, a call from the police station they said there's a bomb threat and we're like, really? a bomb threat? we've never heard of that at, at a show before <laughs> And they were like freaked out, and like, uh oh, what do we do? You know, it's like panic. Uh, they kind of like for about 30 minutes were like, should we go? No, yes, no, yes, no. You know, we were kind of stuck. If we left and canceled the show, it would have been a riot because everybody would have, you know, uh, freaked out. Uh -huh. So we're like, all right, let's just do it, and we'll do the quickest show we can. And they like cut off a bunch of songs, kind of make like a 50 minute set and like no encore and you know <laughs> kind of had the cars ready and they're like all right this might be our last show you know we never know and like we, well, i think we all had vodka i had i had a toast <laughs> all right here we go let's just do it and it was the craziest show it was a live broadcast first of all on radio in poland so time. a live broadcast and you're playing on rented wedding band equipment yes. and there's a bomb threat yes. in poland yeah and it's, it was just everything wrong you know unbelievable but in the end and it, it was well. It, it turned out exciting. The kids went nuts. They climbed up the rafters and were like swinging on ropes. It was like a circus. It was <laughs> insane jumping off the PA system. Like they never had a, a show of that intensity there. So it was unbelievable. And they, and they played the songs extra fast and just kind of like we, we weren't sure what was going to happen. And it was it was really a crazy night. And like I said, we were very thankful. And as soon as we finished, we're out and bam. So I'm looking at the clock. We got. About six minutes left, so let's go into hyperspeed mode. Can you clear up some controversy here? There was the G spot, and then there was the G sun. Now, a lot of people think the G sun is the son of the G spot, but didn't the word didn't the wording say Gilson outside of G sun Studios, and the I and the L didn't light up? Uh, it said it said Gilson and Son or something like that. But that, that's why it was called that was G -Sun. on the roof. Yes. Right? Yeah, there was So it's a, not the son of G-Spot, it's because of that sign. That's 
Well, it was a combination, really, because okay. they called the, the, the old studio at uh, Delicious Lina where we started. That was Mario G's. Ah, uh, okay. And they kind of came up with that concept because everything was G. It was the G spot was the house that they stayed at. Okay. What and then Mario G? G's is my What's studio, up, the, the demo one at, at Delicious Lina. And then when we found the other studio, there was like an old uh, sign up on top of the roof that said Gelsine and Sun or whatever. Like, oh, so this is now the G Sun. I wanted to ask you about Intergalactic and Sabotage, two of the Beastie Boys' biggest hits. Apparently, Sabotage was shelved. They jammed out with it, and there was a, an engineer named Chris, and he's like, yo, dude, that, that rock sounds really cool. And because Chris liked it, they stuck with it. Why didn't you stick with it? I did. I, you did? I, I was a fan of the song. Um, it, like I said, it, the. Well, I, before and some other interviews that it, it was uh, it was just a rock song I, out of all the songs you know it, it kind of stuck out as a rock song and at the moment they didn't, they didn't really want to do a rock song but it sounded really good sonically um, it just came together really amazingly like it was Yao actually thank, thank you Yao for coming up with the, the groove but he really he, he's responsible for that one. He was just playing his face on it. I have a conspiracy theory that he was doing a goof on Aerosmith's Sweet Emotion. Do -do 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 and no, it was Frontline, one of his favorite bands from Brooklyn, actually. So he was playing Frontline and that's how he came up with Sabotage? He, he was, he would always practice songs by this band called Frontline. Right. That he loved. Because they're on time for late. And, that's and, it, and there were similar time. kind of riffs, kind of like that noodley kind of thing. And he loved the super fuzz box that he used. So he would play that, practicing by himself. He was in the room. Eric Bobo walks by, he comes in the room, and he hears that, and he goes to the Tabalis and goes, dang, 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 dang. <laughs> then, and then Mike walks by, go, Mike, get in there, just follow, follow Bobo, you know, and he got on the drums, and went, Bobo, Bobo. And then Mark comes by, what's going on? And I was like, just make, do something, you know, and he went in there, hits one note on the organ, and just like, Bobo. <laughs> make some noise and then Ad Rock comes around and it's like, what's going on? I go, get in there, do something, you know, and he just plays guitar one note. <laughs> Drones it out. And we rocked it and rolled the tape. And it was like, okay, that's done. Like, whatever, you know, put it aside. It's a rock song, you know, like, big deal. And every time we played it, the owner of the studio, the guy named Chris, uh, was like, that's the song right there, that's your hit, that's what you need right there, that's what I'm talking about. You know, he was a real, you know, New York kind of guy, he was just a real funny big guy. And we ended up calling the song Chris Rock. So right. it was called Chris Rock. And every time when we review the songs for the record, like, what about that Chris Rock jam? You know, we put it on and it sounded amazing. Everybody like, like whoa, that shit, you no, know, dope. Like, and then Ad Rock takes it back to his place, and puts lyrics on it, and it becomes a hit. Sorry, we're running out of time. You Quickly, got... Intergalactic. Yes. That was recorded as early as 1994. It didn't get released until 1998. And apparently one of Ad Rock's friends said, hey, whatever happened to that Intergalactic song? He's like, you like that? <laughs> She's like, yes. So if it wasn't for Chris, and I think her name was Penelope, Penelope. if it wasn't for Penelope, yeah. we wouldn't have Sabotage or Intergalactic. Once again, where were you, Mario C? I was right there. <laughs> I was just recording it and just waiting, you know, things, they have their time for incubating and, you know, uh, marinating until they're ready. So it wasn't ready in 94. The song Intergalactic, it actually changed a lot from the, the original idea, because actually it was just the lyric that was cool. The music wasn't ready in 94, but the idea of something intergalactic was It wasn't was right. Yeah, it was, it was at like the a, end of... a green banana yeah. that needed to turn into a yellow banana. That's exactly it. So. Final question, Mario C. I know there is stuff in the vault. I know before you died, November of 2011, they go into the studio. What will happen with this stuff? And I would like you to oversee it since you produced three of the Beastie Boys albums. I love it. That would be great. Um, to answer your question, there are, at least that I know of, that I worked on, like a handful of, you know, un unreleased tracks that didn't make it for some reason or another. But after that, when they moved their studio to New York, and they were out here, they have their oscilloscope studio, they recorded a lot of stuff. 
I hip hop, Yauk, rock, punk, whatever they wanted. Yauk, Yauk, they, they had their own studio, and I was I was in so LA. So what's, what's gonna happen with it? Uh, good question. I'm sure they're just sitting on it. You know, they, they kind of let him do what he wanted to do, and whenever he said he wanted to record, they go and record. So there is some stuff there. I I haven't gone through it and haven't heard it, but I'm sure there is stuff. You know, because so was, who's uh, who's sitting on it? The guys, you know, the band. The guys are. Yeah, yeah. If you would call one of the guys up and said, hey. Can I check it out? Adam, Did they let Mario C check it out? Maybe, but it's a delicate subject at I know. the moment. No, so I know, like, I know. It's, it's kind of like, you never know, but it's more like the family thing, you know? The, 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 his, the family has to be all involved and everybody. This is the, uh, the, the clock ding. ding. One bonus question. Sure. Do you really like to keep it clean? <laughs> You can ask my wife and kids, <laughs> but I, uh, I do, I'm, I'm a, a, a clean fan. Ladies and gentlemen, Mario!